So for part A, there's no work to do. You're just going to write it down. If you tracked what we've done all semester long, can you write down an open form expression for this function B? <clears throat> How many people think they can do it? Only one, only two, three, four. Okay, go for it. The integral? Okay. Does that get the function b as described? So at time equals 0, what number of cells does this expression give us? No, this expression right here, at time equals 0. At the reset, right? At the reset, our amount of accumulation is 0. But what do we need B to be at zero? So how can we fix that? Just add 250. So that we'll have that initial 250, and then what? We'll start accumulating, starting at time equals zero at this rate. There it is. OK, so what will it take to get a closed form version of B? A closed form version of B. How can we get that? Antiderivative, right? We know that if we have a rate function, we have an integral of a rate function, then the closed form version is using the antiderivative. Okay, so we got we need the antiderivative of 50e to the point 3t. So this is what we practice on Wednesday. Can we do that? So we got integral, I'll do it down here. Integral of 50e to the 0 0.3t dt. And we're thinking about what function, what function would have a derivative like that? Would have a derivative like that? So what do we got? We got 50e to the something. So what function would have a derivative 50e to the something? O oh, thou masters of derivatives. Do, do we lower the power in the when we do the e derivative? We add? Derivative of e to the x is e to the x plus one? E to the x minus one? Right. Okay, so first attempt. What's our first attempt? Fifty. E to 0 0.3t. That's so, why? Because the derivative of e to the something we know is e to the something. So the antiderivative of e to the something is just that e to the something, right? But that's just the first attempt. We got we have a little mess to clean up. So this is almost right. We got to what do we do? We take the derivative. Take the derivative, and what do we get? We get 50e to the 0.3t. Is that all? No? No, not plus c. We're taking the derivative. We're taking the derivative. Times 0.3. Times 0.3. And we compare that to our original functions. And then we make a second attempt, right? Second attempt. Is? How do we adjust our first attempt so that if we took the derivative of it, we'd get exactly this? What would we do? What do we do to this so that when we take the derivative, what? The point 0.3 is not there. That's what we're saying. 
divide by 0.3, right? Or take 1 over 0.3. So our, our second attempt would be 50. It's right up here for room. 50 over 0 0.3 e to the 0 0.3t. And that's an antiderivative of our rate function. That's an antiderivative. Because if we took the, what? Why? Because if we took the derivative of it, we'd get exactly that. So now we're ready to write a closed form version of B. I did it in red. Closed form version of T, B is 250 plus 50 divided by 0.3. times e to the t, and then we're going to what? Evaluate that from 0 to x. Are you following what's going on? So this is our antiderivative. We know that, so this is what the fundamental theorem says, is that if you're accumulating at a certain rate, that's equivalent to what? The final value of the quantity minus the initial value of the quantity. So accumulating all the little bits of change is the same as the total change. The final amount at x minus the initial amount at 0. And our antiderivative is our amount function. Our antiderivative is our amount function for that function. Okay, so erase here. So then a closed form would be? Two fifty. Plus 50 over 0 0.3 e to the 0 0.3x minus, uh, well, you, we just have one term. We don't have, a, we don't have anything added or subtracted. If there was a bunch of things added or subtracted, then yes, we need, some, need parentheses. Okay, but that's just all one term, so it's just one thing. All right. And is it zero when we plug zero into that? No. What is that when zero is plugged in? One. So it's going to be minus 50 over 0 0.3. And then we could simplify. These are just two constants here. 250 minus 50 over 0 0.3. It's going to be our BT. There's our, not fully simplified, but that's our closed form version of B. And then how do we find the population after 10 days? Oh, sorry. This should be, this should be x. Both of these, these should also be x. Because we used x. No, it should be t. Let's see. We should have, okay, here's what we should have done. If we want bt, we should have made this t and this something else, okay? Because we wanted our function in terms of t in the end. So we should have made this. We should have used this for t. And then use something else in our integral. Say a. Doesn't matter. Any symbol will do. Da. OK? And then in the end, then, we have our function in terms of t, which was what was asked for. T this is a. Here we go. Okay, and then so to get after ten days, we're just going to plug ten in for t. You have it all right now? Okay, so putting lots of stuff together here. Anybody have a question on this example? So you have several web work questions related to this. Now using the fundamental theorem in practice, given a rate function, <coughs> find the accumulation function or the amount function and then use it. Anybody have a question on this example? 
Okay. So then let's talk about Just do a little review and then we're going to talk about an alternate way to think about integral. Okay, so here is, looks like, should look like a familiar set of graphs. Over on the left, I have a rate of change function. And the right, well, why don't you just take a minute to talk to the person next to you. So if that red graph is a rate of change function, what is this, what is this picture showing? If that right graph over there is a red, that red graph on the left is a rate of change. And what is being, what's kind of being, Displayed here. Go talk. What are the blue segments over there? Uh, no. They're reflective of intervals, but those blue segments form what? Proximate rate of change, right? We said in order to what? In order to build an accumulation function, we need constant rate of change. We need constant rate of change to get little increases or little bits of accumulation. So that those blue segments are an approximate rate of change function in order to yeah make an approximate accumulation so this is like showing a reset at one right this is showing a reset at x equals one and then we're going to start accumulating at according to this rate function according to the approximate rate function and what are we going to get we're going to get for each for each rate over there, the first rate over the first interval, we're going to get a little bit of accumulation. So R1 times uh, delta x. And then R2 times delta x. And we're going to, what, sum up all those rates times the change in x to get the current value of accumulation here at something like 4 point, whatever the current value of x is, 4.2 or something like that. Okay, so that's, that's just a quick review. It should be very familiar and seem, seem natural. Okay, so here's an alternate way of understanding integrals. So notice that we've got this product, R1 times delta x. And we could look back at our original array function and see that the R1 is like the height up to the, up to the, uh, the step. And delta x is the width. And so then what is R1 times delta x representing kind of in a geometric sense? Do you see that it could also be the area of that shaded region there, that blue shaded region? Do you see it? Okay. Base times height. The base is delta x. The height is the value of the constant rate of change in the first interval. Does that make sense? Base times height. Okay. So then R2x, similarly. Base times height. And then R3 times delta x, base times height. Okay, so what, what is it doing here? It's, it's calculating what? Areas of rectangles. Area, th this could be thought of as calculating areas of rectangles. And so there would be all of those, uh, those rectangles, starting at, in this case, 1, our reset up to the current value of x, which is something like 4.2. But the only reason this is true, okay, is because we're graphing in rectangular coordinates, okay? Because our going this way gives us delta x, and then the way that we represent uh, the rate for a given interval is height. So it's only because we're in rectangular coordinates that this kind of works out this way, okay? What do we know R1 delta x and R2 delta x and R3 delta x as? What are those quantities? What do we know those as? Each one of those is what? 
No, no, also, no. No, I just told you that the last five minutes. What do we know this as? R1 delta X, R2 delta X. What's that? Okay, everyone in the room should know what R1 delta X represents according to what we studied all semester. What? A little bit of accumulation, right? A little bit of accumulation. A little bit of accumulation all summing up to the current value, total value of accumulation. Okay, but because of how we graph in rectangular coordinates, it could also be thought of geometrically as each one of these has this area of this rectangle kind of up to the graph, right? The area of these rectangles that like reach up to the graph. Okay, but that's only because of our, the way that we graph in rectangular coordinates. Okay, so thinking about it in terms of area, it's true, we can make that work as area, but it's not... It's not a deep mathematical principle, okay? What we worked on all semester is more profound, okay? Looking at rate of change and bits of accumulation to build an accumulation function for some quantity, okay? <clears throat> but we do want to consider this, this, this uh, idea that it can also be thought of as, as areas of rectangles instead of bits of accumulation. Okay, so what happens when we take smaller... Intervals. When we take smaller intervals, we get thinner rectangles. So smaller intervals would be tinier bits of accumulation, but it would, for the area version, it would mean thinner rectangles. That what? That their, their tops are doing a better job mimicking the rate curve. So where are we headed here? <coughs> As our intervals get really small. So exact accumulation, yes, or kind of this exact area. Exact area, what, from the curve to the x-axis, that blue region. Okay, this is how the rest of the calculus world, and at least uh, recently in the United States, this is what they focus on in integrals, okay? But we know better than that, right? So we, we understand this, but... Uh, rate of change and accumulation is what integrals are uh, primarily about, okay? But we understand that you could also think of it as area by saying that each little bit of accumulation could be represented by a, tr a rectangle. Okay, so this, this area is superficial compared to thinking in terms of quantities, okay? Rate of change and accumulation. Okay, so... Let's summarize the two versions, understanding of integrals, two versions, okay? If f is a rate of change function, then what does this represent? Tell the person next to you. Then this integral from a to x, f of t dt, represents what? Include all the details when you talk. Go. You, everyone should know this, all right? If f is thought of as a rate of change function, then what does this expression represent? Include all the details. Okay, let's have some volunteers. I want to hear. Yes, sir. The accumulation from A to X. What do you think? Accumulation from A to X. Is there more? Yeah. Okay. So that accumulation is found by little bits of accumulation. And so uh, according to what? That rate, right? So yeah, so, so pretty good. So it's the accumulation. Here's what I wrote. The accumulation of a quantity with rate f uh, from a reset at x equals a, OK? And that's actually, this is uh, a function, right? So this is actually a function of x, a function of where we're going to stop accumulating. <coughs> okay, that's, that's old hat. We should all know that. So now, so visually here, that 
value of that integral then is this y-coordinate on our accumulation graph if we accumulate up to x, right? It's the y-coordinate of our accumulation graph if we accumulate starting at a up to x, or the total amount of accumulation. Yeah, thank you. Okay, second, version two. If f is any function displayed in rectangular coordinates, it doesn't, it could be rate function, it could be a amount function, accumulation function, a second derivative, doesn't matter. If f is any function displayed in rectangular coordinates, then what does this represent? What, the sum of a bunch of what? What does each one of these represent? Area of a rectangle. So like a super thin rectangle, right? Like a stick, okay? So then that expression then is like summing up all these rectangles, all these sticks. Okay, so the accumulated area between f and the x-axis starting from x equals a. So if we're thinking just about any function displayed in rectangular coordinates, then we could think of this integral expression as the accumulated area between f and the x-axis starting from x equals a. So those are now two ways to think about uh, the integral expression, the integral expression. If f is rate of change, then it's accumulation of the quantity with a reset at a according to that rate. If f is any displayed function, that expression now is an accumulation, think of it as an accumulation of area between f and the x-axis starting from x equals a. Okay, really important slide. Does, is this making sense? Any questions? Okay, so let's kind of look at an example here. So here is this function g of x, and I'm interested in from negative 0.5 to 4. So if g is a rate of change function, then what is this? Going to calculate. If g is a rate of change function, what would it mean to take the integral from negative 0.5 to 4 of g of x dx? <coughs> okay? And we want to be specific. By looking at this graph of the rate, can we be specific? What happens along the way to get the value of that? Yeah? No, g is a rate of change function. So we're talking about g as a rate of change function. So we're not in the context of area. So we're talking about g as a rate of change function. What would that thing mean, and how does it get its value? Yeah? Okay, so it's the exact amount of accumulation starting at negative 0.5 and ending at 4 according to that rate g. Okay, and so how does how is it how is it going to get that amount of accumulation? So let's now look more specifically as x increases from negative 0.5 to 4. How is it going to do that? How is it going to get that amount of accumulation? What's going to happen as it does that? Somebody new. What's happening at the beginning? What's that? Talk to me about rate of change and accumulation here at the beginning. What's happening? What's that? Okay. The accumulate is the accumulation increasing at the beginning. Some are shaking their heads, saying no. Some are saying yes. At the beginning, is the accumulation increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Why increasing? The rate is positive. So when x starts accumulating from negative 0.5, the quantity is going up. It's going up. Why? Because the rate is positive. And then what happens? Then it hits zero. And so the amount, what happens to the amount right here? Positives and has a maximum. Then what happens to the amount? 
decreasing because the rate is negative all through here, right? All through here, the rate is negative, so now we're going down. Until you have a pause in the accumulation, and that pause is a minimum, right? Because we're decreasing, then we pause, and then we're increasing. And then what happens to the accumulation? Okay, so this value, whatever this value turns out to be, takes into account that at first we were increasing, and then the accumulation decreased, and then at the end it started increasing again. All of that is included, all of that is built into this expression, right? We know that. Because when we're moving through in the middle, G is negative. So we're going to be, our bits of accumulation will be negative bits of accumulation, taking away, decreasing the amount. So that's all built into that, right? <coughs> so what would you say the overall value of this integral is? Negative or positive? Maybe negative, why? Yeah, it's, it's negative for a long time and for the greatest values here, right? So, so like all through here, it's negative 10 or lower, okay? Whereas here, it's not very long and it's, it's you know, maybe an average of about 7. Here, it's not very long, an average of about 5. But here, for a much longer stretch of interval, it's negative at about negative 9 or something like that. So maybe, so we would guess that the overall value of this integral is negative, okay? Now we want to think about area, okay? So let's think about area. So now g is just any function. What is this going to calculate? Well, it's going to calculate the exact same value, but now thinking about it in terms of area, What will we get? What's that? Yeah, exactly. So we're going to go from negative 0.5 to 4. And it's going to come along here. And it's first it's going to get the accumulated area over here. But then what's going to happen here when it crosses? It's going to, just like it did with the rate, it's going to start accumulating negative values, right? Negative values that are equivalent to these areas that are pointing down, okay? Areas of rectangles pointing down. And then when it gets to here, then it's going to start adding up again. It's going to start adding rectangles. So the net area, what we mean by net area then, is whenever the graph is positive, whenever the rate or the, the function g is in positive territory, that area between the x-axis and the, the curve is going to get added in. But whenever that function is negative, all that area is going to get subtracted, right? It's going to get subtracted because g is negative. And so, uh, so what happens here? So we're going to have this, we're going to have a positive portion of area. And then this area, although positive, all areas are positive, it's going to get like subtracted out of the integral. And then in the last part, we're going to add in again. Okay, so it's, it's going to be totally the same as if G was a rate. Okay, so we got to see those areas as, it's, we see this as a net area, meaning all the area that's above the x-axis has a positive contribution to that expression. All the areas that are below the x-axis have a negative contribution to that because G is negative. Okay. So the expression for the, what we call the net area is just that single integral from Okay, so that single integral does what? It adds together the red areas and subtracts the blue area. It 
adds together the red areas and subtracts the blue area. Because G is negative in that region, in that, for, over that interval where we get this area that dips below the x-axis. And that's what we mean by net area. Net meaning a difference of areas, right? Net means a difference of areas. Okay? So a new example. Here's F. Here's F. So write an expression that finds the net area bounded by the graph of F from negative 0.5 to 4. What expression would calculate the net area bounded by F and the x-axis from negative 0.5 to 4? Can you write it? Go. Let's see. How about over here? Did you get it? No? How about, is it on your smartphone? Is that where it is? Did you get it? Did you get it? Tell me. Who's tracking here? Did you guys get it down here? Yeah, we think so. Tell me. The uh, integral starting at point, negative point 0.5 uh -huh. to 4, uh -huh. f x dx. He just wants the integral from negative point 0.5 to 4, f x dx. Will that calculate the net area? Any time that f is below the x-axis, what will happen? It will con contribute have a negative contribution to the total value. Anytime that F is above, has a positive contribution. And that's the net area. That's the net area. Sorry, I didn't intend anything, anything like that. Okay. How many people got it before we went over it? Okay. Does it make sense? This automatically will subtract out areas when F is negative and add in areas when f is positive, just like it was if f was a rate function, right? Just think about what, what would happen if f was a rate function. We would be decreasing, or quantity would be decreasing wherever f was negative, and it would be increasing the quantity wherever f was positive as a rate function. So it's gonna do the same, it's the exact same situation with area. Wherever f is below, you're gonna subtract out that area. Whenever f is above the x-axis, you're gonna add in that area. So this does it. So now what do we want? Suppose we want the total area bounded by the graph and the x-axis. Now I want total area. I don't want net area. How am I going to be able to get total area? So I want you to think about that and work on it. <clears throat> and I'll tell you that as a hint. This is 0 0.15. Okay? And this is? 2.8. And I want an expression that will calculate the total area between the curve and the x-axis. Not the net area. Go, work on it.
And then here's a little uh, condition. We're not going to use absolute value. We're not going to use absolute value in any way, okay? Not at first. So no absolute value is allowed. Write an expression that will calculate the total area between the curve and the x-axis from negative 0.5 to 4. No absolute value allowed. Okay, how many people think they can do it? Not enough. What's the problem with just the integral from negative 0.5 to 4? Why? What's the problem with that? What will it do that we don't want? It'll subtract out all of this area. And what instead, the total area means we want to do what? Add it in. Add it in. So how can we finagle this to get the total area? Yeah. Yes, please tell me. Thank you. Okay, one integral, right? Okay. Okay. So you want to, you want to take that, that integral from there to there and add the integral from 0.5 to 2.8 and then add it from 2.8 to 4. Is that going to work? You got the right idea, but if you do the integral from 0.15 to 2.8, what will that integral be like, that value? You're right, but we want to do what? Add in that. Yeah, go ahead. No absolute value. Not allowed. Yeah. You're going to subtract this center integral because it's already negative. If we subtract it, it makes it positive and adds it in. So we're going to do the integrals. So she had the right idea. We're going to do the integral from negative 0.5 to x1, which I told you is 0.15. And then we're going to subtract the integral from x1 to x2. And that will make it positive. And then we're going to add back in x2 to 4. And that will give us the total area. So we need to break it up into separate integrals so that we can find those integrals that are negative and take the opposite of those to make them positive. OK, now, if so, any questions on that? Yes, please. No, because the integral from 0.15 to 2.8 is a negative value, right? It's a decrease. So it's going to be, so if g were accumulation, or g were rate, <coughs> what your total amount of accumulation would be negative. It would be going down the whole time. So if we want, we're trying to get the total area, then we need to make this, that positive. We need to be the opposite of it. It's just on GCA. What's that? On GCA. What comes out positive? Well, I, that's why I said. No, you're doing something wrong on GC then. You're doing something wrong on GC. But we can do it in GC in a second. Other questions on this? Yeah, so if you do it on GC, let's do it. I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay, so what is g of x? But no, let's let's act. No, I'm I'm glad that 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 we talked that you mentioned that because let's actually do it and see what the numbers come out to be. X plus two, x. Times x.
There we go. Okay. So we'll graph that. We don't need to graph it. So what do we say? The the net area would be what? Control shift I from <laughs> negative 0.5 to 4 of G. And we can because because we're doing it to a finite value, we can use x, x is fine. All right, and that's what we guessed, right? We said it looks like the area below the x-axis is going to um, dominate over the two positive areas. And we originally, a while back in class, we guessed that that would be negative. But now if we want that total area, what do we need to do? From negative 0.5 to uh, 0.15, that we said, G. And then minus, OK, so what was that? So that, that, first, that first area there, 4.681 uh, is that red, that first red area, OK? Let's do them all separately so we can see them. All right, then from 0.15 to 2.8, G of X, negative 28.8. So when you do that integral in that center region, that blue, you're going to get what? You're going to get a negative value. That, that blue area, then it's the opposite of that blue area, negative 28.8. Okay, and then from 2.8 to 4, G, and we know that's positive again, 6.5. So here's breaking it up into those three separate areas. And when you go from uh, 0.15 to 2.8, the value of the integral is negative. So if we want total area, total area is going to be 4.6813. 6, 8, 1, 8, 3. And then what? We're going to do minus negative 28.8169, or that center expression, and then plus the 6.5. So about, so it's 40. So, that, so look, here, here's what we're comparing. The integral where we just do one integral across the whole thing and then calculating the total area by subtracting the integral for the region where fg is below the x-axis, 40. So that's total area. And that's net area. Okay, does it make sense? Does that clear it up? Yeah. Any questions? Important concept here. Yeah, sure. So there it is. You can see it all there. So. First red, first red positive, or positive, or area above is positive, area below is negative, area above is positive. To get total area, then you need to take the opposite of where it was negative, and then we get the total area. Okay, so this uh, area is. Uh, important. It's just we know we didn't emphasize that. Um, when you get into Calc 2, let me, let me give you a couple things uh, about Calc 2. The first thing is that uh, in a traditional, okay, don't all pack up. 
Thank you. And so in a traditional uh, Calc 2 course, the focus will be that integral is area. Because they'll have assumed that that's what you focused on in Calc 1, integral as area, which we did today. Okay? But we know better than that. We know that integral is about rate of change and accumulation. Okay? The second thing is, when I did that undoing the chain rule technique, where we kind of we made a first attempt, remember that? What well, we did on Wednesday, and we did one of those earlier today. The rest of the calculus world has a technique called U substitution. Okay, so what we did, undoing the chain rule. I just want to encourage you to do undoing the chain rule because when you get good at it, and you'll practice in your homework, when you get good at undoing the chain rule, it will take a third of the time than to run through this technique. And U substitution is learning something new. So U substitution is like learning a whole new procedure, whereas undoing the chain rule is just reinforcing your understanding of the chain rule, which you already knew. And when you get good at this, I'm telling you, you can do the problems in about a third of the time that you would take you to work out the U substitution method. So if you end up in traditional Calc 2, when they do U substitution, see if you can uh, recall and, and work on or apply what we did, just undoing the chain rule. Okay? So I've got some announcements here. Will you announce that they need to fill out their evaluations for the TAs as well as the professors? Okay, um, that they should do, do it. And do you want to mention to them that um, H is essentially equal to zero, will be called limit as H goes to zero, because that's another like translation they'll need for Calc 2. Not right now. Not yeah. Yeah, not, uh, okay, so the final exam. The final exam is this Tuesday night at 7 p.m. in LSA 191. Okay? I will be, we'll have Monday. Are you having some kind of session on Monday? And I'm going to be Tuesday noon to 2. So maybe we could combine that. You want to do it later in the day? Okay, so anyway, we'll, there's going to be uh, lots of uh, help available to you on Monday and Tuesday from myself and the TAs. Um, and then you've got that web work due at 5, and then I'm going to post a review sheet for the final, just like you've had review sheets for the other exams. So all that stuff will be on Blackboard. Check Blackboard announcements uh, before asking one of us, because all that information should be up soon. The web work, it will be up uh, at 2.30. So we'll open up at 2.30, get going on that. And then it's crunch time. Got to study and then get the help that you need on Monday and Tuesday from us, according to when we're available. Okay, thanks for a great semester.